All right, we're on problem 59. 59 on page 282. If a real estate agent received a commission of 6% of the selling price of a certain house, what was the selling price of house of the house? So the price of the house. Price of house. And they just told us that the real estate agent received 6%, but that alone doesn't tell us much. So statement number 1. They tell us the selling price minus the real estate agent's commission was $84,600. So let's see if we can write that algebraically. The selling price, let's say P for price, minus the real estate agent's commission. Well, they told us at the beginning the real estate received a 6% of the selling price. So that's 0.06, 6% of the price. So they're telling us that that is equal to $84,600. Well, we're done. That's that's a, a a linear equation with one unknown. This is algebra one. You can solve for this. Let's see. This is you could say this is. I mean, if you had to, if you wanted this point nine four p is equal to eighty four thousand six hundred, and then you'd have p is equal to eighty four six hundred divided by point nine four, whatever that is. You get your calculator, but we don't care. We just, we just have to know that we could solve it. Well, since we got so close, let's just solve it. Eighty. Four six hundred divided by point. This is a bad habit when you're taking the GMAT. You want to just know that you could solve it. So the selling price of the house is ninety thousand dollars. We didn't have to solve that. That would be a waste of time on the real GMAT. But I just wanted to show you how easy it was to solve. Statement number two. Statement number two. Let's see if this is ind independently useful. The selling price was two hundred fifty percent of the original purchase price of thirty six thousand dollars. Well, this is. Okay, so the price we we chose p is the selling price, right? The selling price minus right. Everything we talked about before was the selling price, and now they introduced this thing called the purchase price. So the price selling is equal to, and that's what we want to figure out, is equal to 250 percent. So that's 2.5 times the purchase price of thirty-six thousand dollars. So times thirty-six thousand dollars. 36,000. Actually, we didn't have to write this. So the price is 2.5 times 36,000, which is, I'm guessing, let's see, 72. Yep, it's $90,000 again. We didn't have to do that. But once again, this is just a very, this is, this is actually not even algebra. You just have to multiply 2.5 times 36,000, you get the answer. So each of these independently are enough to solve this problem. So that's D. Next problem 60. This yellow is a little bit over the top. Let me do a more muted color. So they write, if the square root of x over y is equal to, what does that say? d? Right, is that what they wrote? Is equal to d? Oh, no, that's equal to n, I think. Right, is equal to n. What is the value of x? So statement number one, they tell us that yn is equal to 10. Well, this is pretty useful because this first equation they gave us, we've just multiplied both sides by y. We get square root of x is equal to y n, right? Y times both sides gets us this. And if y n is equal to 10, then, then we know that the square root of x is equal to 10. So x is equal to 100. So statement a 1 alone is enough. Now, what does statement 2 do for us? They tell us y is equal to 40 and n is equal to 1 fourth. So once again, this this I mean they they substituted everything else, so we just have to solve for x. So both of these individually are enough, so the answer is d, but we could, you know, solve for it just for fun. We get square root of x over 40 is equal to 1 fourth, and then you get essentially solving this, you get square root of x is equal to 10 and you get the same thing. x is equal to 100 and you are all done. Right? And you might say, oh, but isn't there a plus or minus? No, because we're taking the square root of something is equal to 10. We're not saying the square root of 100 is what? If you said, what is the square root of 100, you'd say, oh, it's plus or minus 10. But if we said the square root of something is 10, that something has to be 100. Anyway, next problem. Don't want to dilly-dally. Dilly dally. 61. I want to imbue you with a sense of urgency for the GMAT. How many integers are there between but not including r and s. Fair enough. So essentially, we have to figure out what r and s are, how far apart they are. So statement number one, so integers 
between R and S, but not including. Remember, not including. So statement number one tells us that R minus S is equal to 10. Now this is a, this is an interesting this is an interesting uh, a question because if we knew that R and S were integers, then this could be you know we could just pick R minus S is maybe R is equal to 11 and S is equal to 1. And then if you if you actually just want me to write it out, you could say, well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. How many integers are between the two and not equaling the two? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? But that's if we assume that R and S are integers. And, and this would work for any two sets of integers that are 10 apart. But what happens if we do it a little bit differently? What happens if we say that this is 1.1, 2.1, 3.1? Oh no, sorry. What if it's between 1.1 and 11.1? So if it's 1.1 is r, oh, let me write it this way. What if r was 11.1 and s was equal to 1.1? Then what are the integers between them but not equal? So you start at 1.1, you would have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And now 11 would be included, because 11 would still be less than r. 10, 11. So now you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So statement number one is actually not an enough, because they didn't tell us that r and s are integers. If r and s were integers, then the answer would be 9, in this case. But if r and s are not integers, then the answer could be 10. So statement number one alone is not enough. The answer could be 9 or 10. OK, what does statement number two do for us? Let me do a different color. Statement number two this is an interesting problem. There are nine integers between, but not including, r plus 1, r plus 1, and s plus 1. OK, so this is interesting. So they're telling us that there are nine integers between r plus 1 and s plus 1. So I mean, actually, just looking at it inspection, you could say, oh, well, then there are nine integers between r and s. And they say, but not including. So this is enough. This alone is sufficient, and you don't need statement number one. Statement number one actually doesn't get you anywhere. So let me prove to you that if, if there are nine integers between r plus 1 and s plus 1, well, think of it this way. The, if there are nine integers between r plus 1 and s plus 1, if you subtract one, so s is one of the ones that are between. Uh, I want to make sure I, I I do this I do this right. So if let me let me think of a good way for me to prove it to you. Well, I'll just do it with an example. So let's say let's say that the example is well the the only example let's say it's eleven and. 1, right? This isn't a proof, but I just want to give you the intuition, right? So if r is 11 and s is 1, so then you would have 12. Well, I don't want to do it that way. The easiest way to think about it is it doesn't matter how much you are adding. If you add the same amount to both the bottom rate of the range and the top of the range, it should not change the total number of integers that are between them. So if you were to say, so there would also be 9 integers between r minus 1 and s minus 1. You're just shifting the range along the number line, but you're not going to actually change the number of integers in between them. So if there are 9 integers between r plus 1 and s plus 1, there's going to be 9 integers between r and s. So 2 is all you need. Hopefully that, that's a satisfactory explanation. I didn't want to go into something rigorous when we're trying to imbue you with a sense of urgency. Let's see if I have time for the next problem. Okay, 62. 62. What is the number of members of Club X who are at least 35 years of age? So age, so number whose age is at least 35. So it's greater than or equal to 35, the number whose age is, is true. Okay, they tell us, statement number one. Exactly 3 fourths of the members of Club X are under 35 years of age. So 3 fourths are less than 35. That is fair enough, but that doesn't tell us that doesn't tell us the number that are at least 35. This tells us the percentage. They tell us this tells us that 
one fourth above, or we could say one fourth greater than or equal to thirty five. One fourth of total members, total members, greater than or equal to thirty five. But it doesn't, so it tells us the proportion, but it doesn't tell us the, the total amount. And I just got the one fourth from, you know, three fourths are less than thirty five, one fourth are going to be greater than or or equal to 35 years of age. So one by itself doesn't help us. Let's see what two does for us. The 64 women, am I reading the same problem? OK, yeah. The 64 women in Club X constitute 40% of the club's membership. OK, so 64 is equal to 40% of the total membership. Now we're set, right? Because we can use this equation to figure out the total membership, call it t for total. T is going to be equal to 64 divided by 0.4. Right? They just told us that statement essentially that 64 is 40% of the total. They just they said it's the women and all of that, but they just, they could have just told us that 64 is 40% of the total. So then you can solve for the total, and then you substitute that here, and you say one fourth of the total are are 35 years or older, and you get what we were trying to solve for. And so the answer is one fourth times 64 over 0.4. And whatever that is, you can put it in your calculator. But all we have to care is that when you use both of these equations combined, you are able to solve for the number that are greater than or equal to 35 years old. And each statement alone isn't sufficient. So you need both statements. And that is C. Both statements together are sufficient.